Hi, I'm Guthrie Govan, and I've been asked by the good people at Lick Library to do a little talk on alternate picking and how you can build up speed, how to work on your alternate picking technique. I suppose we should start by uh, thinking about the nature of the pick you use. Um, I'd like to try and sell you two ideas. One, life is a lot easier if your pick is quite thick and rigid and isn't going to flap about. Uh, the basic logic behind this is best understood if you think about a writing analogy. If you were trying to write with a rubber pencil, um, what the end of the pencil would actually end up doing would be a combination of what your fingers told it to do and what the rubber felt like doing. Obviously, you want to cut out that unpredictable element. You want the end of the pick to do exactly what it's told. So the thicker and more rigid that pick is, uh, the better chance you've got. Also, I think you get a wider dynamic range with a thick pick. You can really dig into a note a lot more. Um, the other thing that's, that I've seen hold back a lot of people trying to work on their picking is uh, what happens at the point of your pick. I think it's very, very helpful to have a pointed pick rather than a rounded one. Because if you just think about the, the nature of the pick, it's going to take you less time to get that point from one side of the string to the other. So uh, grab that pointy pick, that pointy thick pick, and uh, let's think about the mechanics of alternate picking. Um, the general idea behind alternate picking is whenever you do a downstroke, rather than following it with another downstroke, you might as well use that upward motion that your hand's doing in between the two downs and play another note with that. So in other words, if you've got a string of notes to play, you should be picking down on the first one, up on the second one, down on the third, up on the fourth. I needn't go on. All right, so... Um, basically, what you need to do with your pick is make sure there's not too much of it sticking out and that you've got a firm grip on it, that it's a firm connection between what your hand is doing and where you're touching the string. Uh, some players like to hold the pick like that, kind of between the underside of the thumb and the underside of the fingertip. I'm more of a fan of tilting the pick round slightly like that, so it's more between that pad of the thumb and the side of the index finger. That seems like a more natural grip, and that way you can keep your wrist straight. Um, as, you, as your hand descends on the guitar, you see how straight the wrist is and that the pick is lined up there slightly at an angle. Uh, some people will tell you the, the angled approach is wrong. I put it to you, it's more like this. Um, if you pick at an angle, you get a little kind of biting attack at the start of the note. Whereas if you pick like that, so the, the flat of the pick is all touching the string, you get more of a round tone. And then you compare that again with the pick at an angle. You hear there's something sharper at the start of the note there. So it's flat, flat of the pick there, and the edge of the pick. They're both valid, and I think it beats buying pedals. It's good to have both of those at your disposal, and I think you can switch between the two. You can find the right amount of angle just by kind of feeling your way around the pick like that. And while your hand's in that playing position, you'll soon find something that's comfortable. If it doesn't feel natural, it, you're probably doing it wrong. So it's worth spending some time just making sure it doesn't tire your hand out when you pick for extended periods of time. Um, try and find something that feels as easy as possible. Uh, the next thing we need to worry about is muting. Uh, whenever you play a note on any string, pardon me if this sounds a bit zen, but that means there's five other strings that you don't want to be hearing. Um, in the case of this note here, it's just third fret on the G string. What you don't want to hear is the the top two strings there, which you'd mute with the underside of this hand, and these three strings here, the wound ones, you don't want to hear those either. So the, the solution there is to incorporate into your picking technique some bit of flesh that you're not using. For me, it's there, although for some players, it's more this part down here, that will rest comfortably on those strings. So you only hear that one note, and when you stop playing, there's a nice, satisfying silence. All right, uh, next thing to worry about is anchoring. I think it's important to uh, feel as many points of contact between your forearm, your hands, and the body of the guitar. Not so important now, I'm sitting here comfortably in a chair, but if I were trying to run around a stage and play at the same time, it would be like trying to hit a moving target. Whereas, if you rest your forearm maybe somewhere around here, and then rest that part that we're using for muting anyway, on the low strings, then you've got a solid connection all the way down and your, your hand almost feels like part of the guitar. 
and then you can start worrying about the actual movement that results in alternate picking. And I've seen a lot of people do this wrong, for want of a better word. Uh, some people think it's best to uh, kind of move the pick like that between the thumb and the forefinger. Now, it seems to me your, your thumb and your forefinger have already got enough to worry about gripping the pick, making sure not too much of it's sticking out, and generally squeezing it to determine how loud the note comes out. You don't want to have to move that whole assembly as well every time you're picking a note. So instead of that, I would say try and lock that thumb and forefinger assembly there, and then let your wrist do the work. It's just slight movements of the wrist. Um, <laughs> Anyone who's tried to play funk guitar will be familiar with this because uh, funk guitar is all about... And it's, it's more clear there when the, the movement is exaggerated to cover more strings that it is the wrist doing the work. Now, I've seen some players get great results picking from the elbow like that. I think the problem there is after about 10 seconds of in, intense picking, you start to seize up along here and you don't want to be seizing up. Um, I think moving from the wrist ultimately is the most comfortable way to do it and uh, therefore the way that you're going to be able to sustain for the longest period of time and no one should be hurting themselves in the name of practice. So, uh... All right, let's take a look at the most basic exercise I can think of for working on your alternate picking and that's the one where you just take one note and pick it down, up, down, up, down, up. And then gradually try and speed it up, aiming for evenness of the notes. And if you can't maintain that for a good length of time, the chances are you're, you're holding the pick inefficiently or you're making your elbow t do too much work. Um, it must be possible to do this for lengthy, lengthy periods because just imagine what a mandolin player has to do. They play everything like that. All right, so uh, if you think from that perspective, alternate picking really isn't anything to be worried about. Um, the other thing you can do, uh, keeping things nice and basic, is just to uh, work on the dynamics. Um, one of, the, one of the most important factors in music is just the, the volume at which you play any given note. And I think it's interesting just to uh, start with a really quiet note and gradually build it up. And down again. Like that. And you learn a lot about how your picking hand works, just by trying to get a smooth rise in the dynamic level there. Uh, when you've got a clean sound like that, it tends to mean that the note gets louder and softer, but even if you've got a lot of gain going on, it'll still make a difference to the sound. Uh, the harder you hit it, the more like Paul Gilbert it sounds. So that's an interesting reference point there. All right, once you work on that for a while, you've, you should find it starts to feel nice and natural and then you can worry more about uh, syncing it up with what this hand is doing. That's all very well, but after a while you want to play some real music. So uh, what we need is some exercises just to uh, try and synchronise those two hands. Now the, the common one that you see all the time is... Um, and that's all well and good, but the, the chances of you using that lick at a gig are fairly minimal. So instead of that, I think we should concentrate on scale-based exercises that actually fit over chords. And with that in mind, um, let's have a look at this one. Um... That's in the key of B flat. Um, not a common rock key, but uh, sax players love it. If you ever have to play with one, you know some notes that work in B flat. And what you're doing there is um, you've got the third, fifth, and seventh frets on the G string. And you're going fourth finger, first finger, second finger, and then fourth finger, second finger, first finger. And 
as you speed that up, you'll find that you reach a point where you can't concentrate on every individual note anymore. And that's when the idea of targeting comes in. The idea that there's one note, in my case it's that one, because it's the first one, it falls on the beat. So as you kind of pick yourself into a frenzy, you're always looking forward to that note. So to start with, you might want to hit that note a little harder, just to make sure you're always aware of where the new pattern starts and the old one's finished. And that will stand you in good stead. After that, if you want to extend that a little bit, the next thing to do would be to make this assumption. Right, I'm using notes from the B-flat major scale. Let's look for other notes from the B-flat major scale on that same string. There's one there on the 8th fret, 10th fret, 12th, 14th, 15th, 17th, 19th. I'll stop there. So that means you can take that same basic pattern and use different groups of three notes. All right, so something like that um, is introducing this new idea where you have to shift this hand as well without this hand that's doing the picking being thrown off course. I'm sure you'll have some fun with that. So let's look at some typical string crossing exercises. There's one that all Paul Gilbert fans will know. Um, once again, a B-flat major note, but this time um, crossing strings there. So you've got this one note on the seventh fret on the G string, and then 10, 8, 7, 8. And 10 again on the D string. So it's a six note pattern, only one of the notes is on the G string. And it's worth checking out whether you can do that starting on a downstroke or starting on an upstroke. Uh, it feels very, very different. You'll probably find one way is easier than the other. But depending on what sort of player you are, it might be that you prefer starting on a down or it might be that the up is easier. Um, um, the thing that not many people go on to do is then try and refinger that exercise. So instead of this, there just being one note on the G string, you might have two. This time your picking hand has to change strings in very different places. This time it's a 7-5 on the G string and then 8 and 7 on the D string. And then you could take that to logical extremes, move down another scale position and refinger it. It's still the same melody. So you've got 7, 5 and 3 on the G string and then just this solitary 7 on the D string and then straight back to the G. And if you can play that lick in all three of those positions, that's a good introduction to string crossing. Hi, this is Guthrie Govan. I'm here to talk about legato. Um, a much misunderstood technique, this one. Um, but a lot of us do it to some extent. Basically, anyone who can't pick every note they're playing is using legato to some extent or another, whether they realise it or not. If you keep things nice and open like that, it's more likely you'll come up with something creative that fits into your own playing using this technique. Uh, first things first, how do you tap? Um, there's two, two kinds of motion here. One is the hammer-on, um, and maybe that bluesy bend at the end from the 15th fret up to an A. Uh, now, the conventional way of picking that would be down, up, down, up. Uh, one day, some time ago, a lazy guitarist discovered that uh, if you just do three downstrokes in a row, it feels like one downstroke. You're saving a lot of movement, and the upshot of that is you can play quicker. 